Welcome to part two of our lectures on freshwater biodiversity in this course section on ecosystem vitality. In this lecture, we'll start off with where we can find compiled biodiversity data in databases or other sources. We'll highlight the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species since we use that in the Freshwater Health Index's biodiversity indicator. We'll look at indicators for the state of freshwater biodiversity and in particular the IUCN Red List Index and the biodiversity indicator of the Freshwater Health Index. And finally, we'll discuss how biodiversity information is being used for guiding policy and decision making. And as a reminder, in the hands-on activities associated with this pair of lectures, you'll be able to take more of a look at finding biodiversity data and applying it to the Freshwater Biodiversity Indicator of the Freshwater Health Index and the Red List Index. And you can look at some examples of recent scientific papers that discuss ways forward for better integration of freshwater biodiversity information into research, management and policy and decide what recommendations seem most important for you. So, in the last lecture, we discussed some principles of collecting freshwater biodiversity data from the field. But in most cases, people don't have the time or the money to implement whole new sampling programs. Instead, they're relying on existing data to assess the state of freshwater biodiversity and how best to use those data. The Red List of Threatened Species, produced by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, is one of the most useful resources for assessing the distribution and conservation status of biodiversity. First off, note that it's not limited only to threatened species. For example, it can include species that are not threatened, such as least concerned species, or those that are data deficient. The Red List includes extensive information for the species, um, information about their distribution, their habitat, population, ecology, the types of threats, their livelihood values, as well as spatial data showing range maps. And the species are assessed according to detailed and standardized criteria that are applied globally. The criteria allow species to be consistently allocated into different categories of threat. There are multiple outputs associated with the Red List. Most immediately, we can compile data and assess which catchments have greatest number of freshwater species or threatened freshwater species. One of the best known outputs is the Red List Index, which is an important metric in assessing the extent of change in relative threat of extinction to species. Without going into detail here, for any particular taxonomic group, the index gives a score of the expected risk of extinction compiled for all the species in that group, ranging from zero, where all the species are extinct, to one, where there is no threat to the species. This index is repeated at regular intervals, and hence you can measure the overall trends in changing risk of extinction for that group of species. Of course, instead of doing this for all the species in a particular taxonomic group, you could do it for a representative section of species across multiple groups for a specific catchment. You will apply data to the Red List Index in the hands-on activities. Another useful application of the Red List is the identification of key biodiversity areas, which are regions that are characterized by highly threatened or locally endemic species, or species that have some special characters of ecological integrity. In the case of freshwaters, these key biodiversity area regions are based in catchments. <clears throat> there are numerous other sources of biodiversity data from local to global scales. Some of these are geospatially referenced data, some are static information, and here are some examples which are also given in the resources for this lecture. The Living Planet Index that we mentioned in the first lecture. This is a data portal that includes information about the size of populations of selected vertebrate species from various parts of the world since 1970. 
We'll also look at this in the uh, hands-on activities for the, the, for the lecture. The Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, has point locality data for species around the world based on collected specimens and observations. Compadre and Comadre databases contain matrix population models of plant and animal species, as well as algae, fungi, bacteria, and even viruses. The Global Fungi database is a global database of fungal occurrences based on metabarcoding genetic sequences. FishBase is a global database of information, including distributions for fishes. NatureServe Explorer gives species data for the Americas, including static maps and data, and there are some spatially downloadable data sets. Odonata Central is a great resource for dragonfly data for North America. iNaturalist is a network of naturalists and citizen scientists who map and share biodiversity observations online. And the Global Invasive Species Database includes extensive information on invasive species. These are just some examples of some good global databases and regional databases. With any of these, it's important to know the, the source of the data, whether, for example, the distribution data are modeled, as in the fish base example, or whether the data come from museum specimens, including historical records that might not be relevant to the current condition of the region. For example, this is the case in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF database. Or whether the data come from genetically sequenced specimens, as in the fungal database. Erroneous data can also creep into any of these databases but some of them have systems where possible errors are flagged or where validation by experts have been given. So look out for any such information when you're researching these databases. Also, think carefully about the scale at which the data have been collated and presented. For example, the map on the left shows global patterns for non-native fishes. It's quite coarse grained and is only really useful at large regional levels. Whereas the map on the right shows distributions of non-native plants and animals for the US at a much finer spatial granularity. And this will be more, more appropriate for studies of ecosystem condition in river basins. In some instances, it might be difficult to find those more fine grained data. For example, the global data in the red list might not be available for the region you want. We'll look at this um, more in the, in the hands-on activities. Many countries produce their own national red lists. You just have to be careful here because these might not have been coordinated via specialists at IUCN using the IUCN process. So the interpretation of the criteria might not be consistent. And in some cases, they may be using an older version of taxonomy for the species. And so using different names to those used in other global databases. You may also be able to find reports of regional, national or local monitoring of species abundance with very specific demographic data. The Freshwater Health Index user manual suggests using local survey data wherever available for calculation of its biodiversity indicator. So next we'll talk briefly about the biodiversity indicator for the Freshwater Health Index. So. The biodiversity indicator includes two components. One focuses on changes in the presence of species of concern focusing on the proportion of threatened species present, the change in number of species of concern over time, and changes in their population sizes. The other component fo focuses on changes in abundances of invasive species in much the same way as the process for proportion and change in threatened species. The component that is used most is the first one, looking at threatened species of concern. You'll look at these components in more detail in the hands-on activities. Now, I did a quick analysis of the Lower Congo region, which I discussed in the first biodiversity lecture. Um, and I did this just for the first step, the, the, the proportion um, of species of concern for the Freshwater Health Index. I mapped out my region 
assimilated data from the Red List website and use the spreadsheet, spreadsheet calculator that you'll use in the activities to calculate the index values. The result was relatively high with um, 0.703 for the Freshwater Health Index um, uh, proportion of species of concern indicator. And it was um, similarly relatively high um, for the Red List Index at 0.931. Now this is an area that has relatively high endemism and high uh, numbers of species and is currently in res reasonably good condition. But we also know that it and its species are potentially threatened by things like increasing pollution and hydropower development. It is worth noting the growing recognition of the importance of biodiver biodiversity information for policy and management from glo global to national scales. For example, the red list data are important for the identification of potential Ramsar sites, that is, wetlands of international importance. There are several criteria for designating Ramsar sites. Most significantly, criterion two is based on the presence of threatened species as defined by the red list. But many other criteria rely on data for species diet distributions, which is also included in red list accounts. These are all photos from Ramsar sites and the middle image is of Poyang Lake in China um, and that has also been a case study site for the application of the Freshwater Health Index. There's a five minute video about the Freshwater Health Index work at Poyang Lake and the link to this is included in the resources. This figure from a recent publication by Van Rees et al. shows some of the global and European policies where freshwater biodiversity is directly relevant. They're quite varied. We just mentioned the Ramsar Convention, and we'll mention the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Sustainable Development Goals in a minute. The paper goes into quite some detail on the European Water Framework Directive. And they highlight the fact that the Water Framework Directive draws on the application of integrated water resource management for establishing good ecological status for all water bodies. And this is based upon biological quality as well as chemical quality, water quantity and connectivity. Integrated water resource management is a process which promotes the coordinated development and management of water, land and related resources in order to maximise economic and social welfare in an equitable manner without compromising the sustainability of vital ecosystems and the environment. It's an example of where biodiversity data can be applied for management and policy more at the catchment scale. And the Ramsar Convention included integrated management as part of its strategic plan for 2016 to 2024. However, this part of the integrated water resource management on not compromising ecosystems in the environment tends to get overlooked compared to maximizing economic and social welfare. A study, albeit back in 2004, highlighted this, showing that at that time, few water resource management programs addressed biodiversity planning as a long-term goal. Less than 40% of country programs included visions for biodiversity conservation. Now, that may well have changed, but the underrepresentation of biodiversity and ecosystem function in integrated water resource management planning is still a problem. Let's look at some of the other policy areas where biodiversity information is important. There's an appreciation that biodiversity, including freshwater biodiversity, has a central role to play in the process of achieving sustainable development. This is evident from this recent publication on the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. It notes that conservation of biodiversity is one of the most potent levers for sustainability. <laughs> 
and it highlights the importance of SDGs 14 and 15, addressing biodiversity on land and in water, on securing many of the other SDGs. The co-benefits are shown proportionately in blue in these circles, and the trade-offs are shown in red. So if you look at something like SDG 15, which is focused on maintaining ecosystems on, and biodiversity, you see it references several of the features that we have discussed, the red list, key biodiversity areas, monitoring presence of invasive species as indicators. And several of those same features are also being suggested as indicators for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework being developed by the Convention on Biological Diversity. For example, the red list, key biodiversity areas, the green status of species, which is a complementary indicator to the red list and which assesses the recovery of species populations and measures their conservation success, and an indicator for invasive species. So biodiversity information is important as a measure of conservation and sustainable development at the global level. But this is also true at other scales. The global targets for SDGs will actually be implemented at national scale. And the post-2020 commitments will be implemented at the national scale through things like the National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, the MBSAPs. We already discussed the application to regional policy with things like the EU Water Framework Directive and application to catchment scale integrated water resource development. But remember, we noted a few minutes ago that integrated water resource management doesn't take biodiversity into account very well. And it's also evident that SDGs aren't taking natural resources, including freshwater biodiversity, into account as well as they should do. This pie chart shows the proportion of SDG indicators that actually measure natural resources or their protection, which is less than 10% in each case, versus 84% for socioeconomic focused indicators. These images on the right, by the way, are of the Inga Dam complex that threatens the biodiversity of the Lower Congo River. You can see the rapids, which you saw in a slide in the first lecture on biodiversity, in the background. There are proposals for further dams here and elsewhere on the Lower Congo. So this is all to illustrate that the need to conserve freshwater ecosystems and therefore support the sustainable delivery of their natural benefits is already known but as perfectly stated by Tom Lovejoy, the health of freshwater biodiversity has been particularly neglected because freshwater is widely understood and managed more as a physical resource, vital to survival, rather than as the special and delicate habitat that it provides for an extraordinary array of organisms. Again, the Inga Dam um, example on the right is a, is a, is a case in point. Essentially, water and freshwater ecosystems containing it are viewed as a commodity. In conclusion, we have some great resources in terms of information on biodiversity research, conservation and management, but there's plenty more work to be done. And in the last couple of years, there have been some important publications highlighting priorities for action. Several of these are listed in the resources. For example, this recent paper by Harper et al. discusses the types of research questions that we should be asking in order to achieve restoration and conservation of freshwater systems. And one of the assignments for this lecture is looking at this paper by Marsri et al. on how we might develop a global agenda for advancing freshwater biodiversity research and implementation of that research towards conservation action. In fact, a key issue as we move forwards is that while we may have some gaps in data and knowledge, these are not barriers to us for getting freshwater biodiversity conservation done. 
And then what we really what we really need to do is to use our existing knowledge better and focus on implementing some of the conservation actions that are being recommended in these papers and elsewhere. And importantly, we must get engaged with the full spectrum of stakeholders and practitioners that can help make this happen. So, in conclusion, from these two lectures on biodiversity, we've learned that Freshwater ecosystems are among the richest on the planet in terms of diversity of species compared to the available area of the freshwater habitats. These ecosystems and the species they support provide a wealth of important ecosystem services to people. They're the most threatened ecosystems on the planet compared to those of marine or terrestrial biomes. Assessing the status of freshwater biodiversity requires assimilation and analysis of species data, which requires standardized and reliable infield techniques of biodiversity monitoring. Those data are often compiled into local and global databases. And those databases can be used for developing indicators of biodiversity condition, such as the Freshwater Health Index Biodiversity Indicator. There's a growing recognition of the importance of biodiversity information for policy and management from global to national scales. And there are several recent publications that discuss our future priorities for research and conservation action for freshwater biodiversity, how to best use our existing knowledge, and how to bring together the full spectrum of stakeholders and practitioners to achieve this. That concludes the second and final part of the lectures on biodiversity. Thank you for your attention. Please rewind and replay any parts of this lecture that were not clear to you. When you're ready, please move on to the hands-on activities linked to this lecture. You will also find a full set of resources cited in both these lectures on the course website.